Hello, everybody, and welcome from the virtual ASCIT. It is a true joy and a pleasure to be, well, for you to be joining me on this uh, occasion, on this webinar, on this virtual uh, ASCIT experience. And we're going to run through the various aspects of the British summer season. And um, hopefully, I will be able to give you some insight into the history of certain uh, aspects of the English season and how it's still very prominent today, although not overly um, strict as far as it was uh, up until uh, the, debutant, the last debutant ball was ended back in the 50s. I would love to share with all of you uh, the opportunity to engage with me, to ask questions. Um, my colleague Carol will be uh, covering the back end of this webinar. So please do drop questions into the bar, into the chat. Uh, for me, it is wonderful uh, to see and hear uh, of some familiar faces, people who support the British School of Etiquette wholeheartedly. I thank you um, from the bottom of my heart and from our team's heart for supporting us. It, it, it really is a great honor to engage with such amazing people. And here at the British School of Etiquette, we are so blessed and so privileged with, the, with the, the, the type of people who engage with us. These are people who really want to grow and who want to succeed and who want to help so many other people in this world. And this is the true reason why the British School of Etiquette was founded. It was founded purely on giving people the opportunity to build confidence and to engage with people on all levels with that wonderful French, French phrase called savoir faire, knowing what to do in any given situation but you also need the baba boom for life, the savoir vivre. This is absolutely crucial. It really and truly is. Now, one of the things when it comes to Alaska, when you are indoors, a gentleman in the world enclosure may remove his top hat. And that's exactly what I'm going to do on this occasion, only because um, I don't feel overly um, comfortable in the sense of no one's here to join me and um, I hope it doesn't look too silly with the hat off. Right, so I'd love to get started and as, as I said, I want questions to flow in. Um, I cannot see uh, anybody at the moment, so I haven't got a list of names. I don't know if Carol can bring that up on the screen for me at some point so I can get familiar with some of the participants' names. If you're able to do that, Carol, that would be absolutely amazing. Uh, I would love the opportunity to engage with people by name. I know Maria is joining us uh, today. Hello, Maria, from all the way from Portugal. Hola and obrigado. Uh, Maria is uh, an attendee of our uh, Royal Ascot uh, annual event. Uh, last year, Maria uh, popped over from Portugal and we were able to engage in the most wonderful day. We were blessed with incredible weather and incredible people. And I will share the journey with you as we get into the slide presentation. Before we do get going, if there are any questions, drop them in the chat box or in the question and answer box, and we can tee these questions up and I can interject during the, the presentation, or we can wait till the end in order to uh, try and answer your questions. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, get going with this, uh, this presentation. And I know there is a facility to put your hand up. So if I'm losing anybody, if I'm not making myself clear, if there are any questions about that particular slide that we're on, please, please do feel free to ask a question. This is what this is about. I want it to be as interactive as possible. So we've got Minnesota coming in. We've got, um, who, where, where, where else are some of the attendees coming on? Please, attendees, do share where, you, where you're dialing in from. It would be amazing to know who is engaging with us and which parts of the world. So uh, don't be shy. Do not be shy, please. Right. I'm just going to close this down and I'm going to get started. All right. So where did this all start? Where did the English social season really come about? And it really is a world-renowned, famous period uh, in, in, out, of, well, out of the UK. People from all over the world were, became very, very familiar with 
the English season for all its social and sporting events. The Ascot and the sporting uh, and social events of the English season had been around for well over 300 years. And it was very much um, focused, whether we like it or not, around the upper echelon of society. They would come down from their beautiful country homes to, to London, where they would have obviously a, a, an amazing property here in London. They would bring their whole household, the cavalry, the staff, the horses, the carts. So for any of you who've um, been introduced or seen something like Downton Abbey, this is exactly how it was in those days, right up, literally right up until the 1950s. And still today, believe it or not, there are people who travel in from not only around the United Kingdom, but from around the world to come and attend these amazing social events throughout the, uh, the, the spring and the summer season here in the UK. There's a, there, there was a, um, the, the term for the devs, or as they know it, the debutante ball, and this was the coming out for young ladies. This was, uh, gave uh, the, um, the parents the opportunity to show their daughters um, at the age of, about, they could be coming into the age of, of, of being married or, or looking for a suitable suitor with the view to marrying the right so-called gentleman or the right sort of family. As you can well imagine, this particular period and era was very, very focused on who's who in the zoo. Who, oh, it's so-and-so, so, and so, so ooh, have you met Lord Lady of so-and-so? Oh, isn't it sound rather charming? I think he'd be a really, really good suit for your daughter. And so this was really the way this, this whole movement sort of operated. The debutante ball was pretty much at the beginning of the season. And from there on, it was one big party, literally one big party. What I want you to understand is that majority, majority, I would say almost 99%, of the people who came from their country homes to their London homes were, were not working. They, they were very much um, in, a, in, a, in a league of their own from a financial point of view, and so they didn't work. It was just one continuous party. They would arrive, and the done thing was to drop off what they called calling cards. So if there were certain people that you wanted to engage with in that period, in that era, you would have your butler or your footman go and drop calling cards off at certain residences announcing that you A, were in London, and B, that you would love an invite to come over for tea, or a cocktail party, or even a dinner. And it was very, very formal. Everything was handwritten, obviously, and everything was delivered by a, uh, a staff member. And it really was uh, one whirlwind, as, as it's been put there in the slide, of incredible um, soirees, parties. You can imagine the shenanigans that was going on in that period as well. Um, thank goodness there was no social media because I think it might have even shocked what we even see today. So I think uh, let's leave, let's sleeping dogs lie. And again, I want to just come in, uh, just break down how the season sort of works. And there are many more than, than what's been listed on that slide, but these are the really most popular events of the social season. They're smaller ones which people take, uh, um, go to and attend. The boat race is known as the Cambridge and Oxford boat race. Very, very famous for those of you who are not familiar with that. Starts at Putney Bridge and goes all the way through to Hammersmith Bridge. It draws the crowds in droves. I mean, you have no idea. The whole river on either side is just lined with people cheering on the boats, uh, the, 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 the crew and the coxes who are the gentlemen or ladies shouting the odds and spurring people on. Grand National, for those of you who don't know, that is a horse race where it incorporates fences or hedges as they know, and these are exceptionally high. Horses are uh, incredibly uh, um, physical uh, race, and unfortunately not to bring in doom and gloom to this um, wonderful event that we've got here today, but unfortunately some horses do get injured. It is a very, it's a ferocious race and again draws many many people and that takes up in the north of england um, up near cheshire the, the near manchester sort of area i'm sure a lot of you watching uh, tonight or today the chelsea flower show it is just one of the most beautiful events to attend bar it does attract a huge amount of people and why i say bar it does attract a huge amount of people is because it really does get very very busy so it's good to choose your day and try and get there as early as possible and really embrace the day i would love to share something with with you uh, watching here today is that there's also the royal hampton 
called Flower Show. So for any of you who are not familiar, but there's uh, King Henry VIII's castle, which is in Hampton Court. It is hugely spectacular. I would almost put that uh, now in, in the social calendar in the summer season event because it really is very, very spectacular. It's on a grander scale to the Chelsea Flower Show and as spectacular in my view. And I've been to both. And I would urge any of you, if you love plants, if you love to see beautiful things, if you love to see incredible design and architecture, huge talent across the board, I would urge you to, to come to the Hampton Court Flower Show. Glyndebourne takes place in a private home in Sussex, which is south of London. And again, I've been privileged enough to attend that. That is an incredible experience. Men get dressed up in black tie. So what I'm wearing today is the traditional morning suit, which I would be permitted to wear in the royal enclosure. And I will explain that to you a little bit later on into, into today's event. But Glyndebourne is, a, you know, you take your picnic. And on one occasion, I had the most wonderful experience. I was invited by a gentleman who, who is uh, actually, he's got a title now, and we organized, uh, he said, Philip, please organize the event. So I got hold of a butler friend of mine, uh, and Sylvain, his name was, and I gave him the menu, and um, my colleague, my friend, said, please go and choose some very nice wines and champagne to complement the meal that we're going to have. And we packed up a picnic table, some chairs, and it was just the four of us, my, my friend, and, and two just female friends, no, no, no connection in, in relationship-wise. And we went off to, to Glyndebourne to watch um, Madame Pontuti. And you go to the, the, the first part of the event, and then in the intermission interval, you come back to where you set up your picnic table. And Sylvain had set up this amazing picnic table, and we were served with attention to detail uh, as if we were royalty. It was quite an extraordinary event. Uh, we went back to finish off the, the, the uh, opera, and Sylvain had packed everything up, popped it back in the car, and he very kindly drove us back to London. So for any of you who love opera and love the classical, sort of music, the grounds of Glyndebourne are breathtaking. Uh, it is just an extraordinary event. When it comes to June, June is really, I suppose, one of the most action-packed in this social calendar. Royal Ascot is obviously the main event for today, and I would love to come back and talk to you about that. I popped in their Queen's Tennis Championships. This is the pre-warm-up to Wimbledon. So we have the ladies one, which takes place in Bournemouth, and the Queen's Tennis Championships takes place in Barron's Court, which is London, in, in um, the Queen's Tennis Club. That's why it's known as the Queen's Tennis Championship. And it used to be sponsored by Stella Artois. So it had the nickname Stella, the Stella, the Stella Tournament. And again, I've been very blessed to go to these tennis matches uh, without sort of sounding arrogant or name dropping. I was, um, my sister married an incredible gentleman who was an international tennis player and a double specialist. He actually won Queen's Tennis on two occasions. He was runner-up at Wimbledon, he won the Australian Open in the men's doubles, and he won the US Open in the men's doubles. His name is Kevin Elliott. If any of you are tennis fans, look him up, an incredible talent. So I've been very blessed to attend a lot of these events that I'm sharing with you. We then go on to Wimbledon, and for any of you out there, I urge any of you, even if you're not a tennis fan, this for me is possibly one of the, bar the horse racing, as far as ball games go, and I love my rugby, I enjoy the odd game of football, but for me, Wimbledon is one of the most beautiful events you can attend. The energy around the, the stadium, you get to see incredible tennis because uh, the, the courts are all open. The only courts that you really need main tickets for would be the centre court, court number one, and one or two of the other exhibition uh, courts. But the rest, the first week of Wimbledon is just amazing. You can walk around and you will see some of the most incredible tennis you've ever seen in your life before. And then obviously com complemented by the world famous pims, pims and lemonade, sprig of mint in there, some strawberries, a few uh, grapes and cucumber, and obviously complemented without a doubt with fresh strawberries and cream. Polo lovers, again, the UK is synonymous uh, with its polo events. We have the Cartier Cup, we have the Chesterton's Polo in the Park event, we have an amazing event. Uh, in London, funny enough, of all places, in, in an incredible venue just on the Thames. Uh, and again, the name escapes me, but, but it will come back to me. And they also have a, a tennis exhibition tennis match there as well around the Wimbledon time. Moving into July, things start to slow down ever so slightly. There's the Hindi Regatta. Now that again is 
hugely famous from all over the world. People from all over the world representing different rowing teams will come and compete at the Henley Royal Regatta. For those of you who are not familiar with England, just outside London on the way to Oxford, as in where Oxford University is, Henley sits just before Oxford. It is a picturesque village it, and, and just comes to life uh, when the regatta takes place. August comes Cows Week, and again, I've been fortunate to attend Cows Week. It is a small little island, believe you me, it's tiny. And the Cows Week is for, for people, anyone who loves sailing, who loves the water, uh, you often even hanging around Cows Week may even get picked if they need an extra crew member. And then the world famous proms, which take place here out of London, and those are classical music events and people performing of all, of all ages, uh, all parts of the world attend the proms, and again, another hugely, hugely spectacular event. So coming on to where we sit today, and as you all know, and again, thank you for making the time to attend today's event. You can see clearly on the screen in front of you that these events have had to be shifted onto different platforms without actually being physically able to go there. And I picked up snippets of the Chelsea Flower Show online, and I have to say they did a wonderful job of um, creating an ambiance and showing, again, that amazing, amazing talent. I heard the other day through a Wimbledon friend of mine, a correspondent, that this year with Wimbledon, and again for you tennis nuts out there, they're going to be showing some incredible, they put together a whole series of some of the most incredible Wimbledon history uh, that will run over the Wimbledon uh, period this year, uh, just to try and hopefully fill that amazing gap uh, and that amazing loss that we'll all feel. Uh, and as you all know out there, I think sports and, and these sort of events really bring people together. People thrive off the energy, people mingle, people have a great time, and people create incredible, incredible memories. Believe it or not, Royal Ascot's happening as we speak. There have been some winners today. Uh, they started the Royal Ascot yesterday, and unfortunately it's on behind closed doors. But I do know that the bookies are out there, you can place your bets. And as it's well known, Royal Ascot, it really is, I'm not a betting man, but I have to say, whenever we go to Royal Ascot, I put 20 to 30 pounds aside. I sort of sidled up to one or two people who seem to know what they're doing, and I say, which horse are you going for? Which horse are you going for? And funny enough, last year, uh, I didn't manage to win huge money, but um, I got uh, a few lucky tips, and I think I made one or two pounds, but I didn't lose, thank goodness. And some of my colleagues or friends that came and joined us last year actually did very, very well up in betting. So it's fun, it's an easy place to cut your teeth. It really isn't only, as you can imagine, just about the horse racing. And I think which horse event these days is just about the horse racing. There's so many other reasons to attend these amazing events. They really are, just even if it's just a people watch. If you're an avid people watcher, oh my hat, you will be in seventh heaven watching people. Just, you could stand in one spot for an hour, two hours, with a glass of champagne in hand, and maybe a spare bottle, you will be mesmerized at what you see. When it comes to Royal Ascot, um, as I'm sure some of you may know, but I'd love to just recap, it's well over 300 years, uh, years old. Queen Anne was the responsible founder, and it has been supported ever, ever since through the monarchy. The monarchy are hugely, hugely passionate about their racing, and as I'm sure most of you out there know, the Queen loves her horses, and she's had some winners. She's had some fantastic winners over the years. Um, I think her last major winner was... Actually, I've got it written down over here. Her last major winner was, um, let's see it over here, just, to, just sorry to break away. The last major winner was known as Estimate, and that was in uh, 2013. The Philly Estimate landed the Gold Cup, and today the Gold Cup is still a Gold Cup. So the winners of the race actually get presented with a Gold Cup. The dress code within within Royal Ascot is incredibly strict in the majority of the enclosures. The good news is they've opened up, they've opened up Royal Ascot to anyone who really wants to attend. However, there are certain enclosures which will be depicted on the next slide that I bring into play, but there are certain enclosures that there is a very, very, very strict dress code. There are other areas where it's not as strict, uh, maybe even leans 
whether you like it or not, could even mean not so much to fancy dress as in costumes, but some of the outfits that people wear um, could make your head turn very, very quickly. We've seen some extraordinary sights uh, when, when we've been to Ascot in the past. And I think if you just Google pictures of Royal Ascot, you will see some quite entertaining sights and pictures. Moving on to the next um, slide here, this is really uh, something that I just want to share with you. It, for those, again, of you who know um, Ascot or know the area, Berkshire is one of the counties that sits in, in the United Kingdom, and it's not that far out of London. So to get from London to Berkshire, what we normally do is with our group is we hire a really lovely bus and we leave from one of our venues in Mayfair, which uh, generally we leave at about 8.30 in the morning, and we're there for about quarter past nine. So it's a very easy uh, exit out, out of London. And I, I just want to just you to understand how many visitors it actually attracts every single day. 300,000 people. And I promise you right now, you will, again, for those of you who have attended, you will be amazed at how smooth it is. There doesn't ever seem to be anyone on top of you. Yes, when you get to watch a race and you come out into the stands or you, you come out onto the lawns, it does get a bit tight because everyone's keen on the racing. But in between the races, everyone separates, they mingle, they go out there, they socialize. And again, it just lends for such an incredible energy and ambiance. You will see that we've broken down the different enclosures. So if I can explain to you, the Royal Enclosure is the elitist of the enclosures. No one, not just anybody, can enter the Royal Enclosure. A, you have to either be invited by a Royal Enclosure member, or you have to be a member. That is the only way that you can get into the Royal Enclosure. You can be invited to be a member of the Royal Enclosure. You can be invited by two existing members, but they have had to have attended Royal Ascot a minimum five times since they joined and became a member. So just to recap, five years or five individual occasions, could be over a 10 year period, as long as they've attended five times, they can second you, they can sponsor you to become a member of the Royal Enclosure. As a member of the Royal Enclosure, I am allowed and permitted to take two guests. Each year I can take two guests. And again, as a member of the Royal Enclosure, I am able to attend every single day of Royal Ascot. Obviously I have to pay for my ticket, but my membership covers me, allowing me to go every single day. The other thing that it also allows me to do is attend other events throughout the Ascot race season. So I want you to understand that Royal Ascot is not just about this week. There are many amazing events at the Royal Ascot venue, which is outstanding. And, and so if you can't ever get to Royal Ascot and you happen to be in the UK, go on the Royal Ascot or go on the Ascot website and you'll be able to discover what events are taking place. And it really is a, a, a beautiful, beautiful treat. The Queen Anne enclosure is a non-member uh, uh, venue or area. And again, there is a very strict dress code, which I will share with you shortly. The Windsor enclosure again, and the village enclosure all sort of married together. So when you look on the uh, Royal Ascot venue guide, you will see how the enclosures interlink across the area of where it's private. It's not just any access. And you will absolutely understand how they've broken it up into these amazing areas of entertainment. I think this year, if Royal Ascot had been running uh, for, for us as guests going there, there was something like six or seven Michelin star restaurants being represented at the venue this year. And each year it gets better and better. They are always trying to outdo themselves. They are always trying to make a difference. And last year we had the privilege of going into the Royal Enclosure and taking some guests to one of the private venues. Uh, again, it was a new addition from the year before. And the, um, the venue itself, I have to say, the training they give the staff there's never a moment when you feel that, no, that people are untoward towards you. If you need any directions, if you need help or guidance, there are just incredible staff members who've been beautifully trained to make you feel very at home. So they've almost created the, the, the staff members, the service staff to be hosts as well, not just serving you. Moving on to this next slide over here. Again, the Queen, as you all know, who is recently obviously celebrated her birthday, is synonymous 
with Royal Ascot. She attends every single day when Ascot is on. And sure enough, at 2 p.m., there is a, um, a, a, a signal and she comes in her horse and carriage, trotting down the, the last third off and in through the tunnel. And for those of you who've joined us at Ascot, we have been up close and personal, literally no word of a lie, two meters away. I could have taken a yardstick and tapped the queen on, on the shoulder, although I think I may have been arrested. But it's that close. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And not only the queen, her honorable, honorable, honorable guests and various other members of the royal family who are in attendance on that particular day will come trotting past you and into the winning enclosure. So the enclosure that the winning horses get taken into at the end of every race. The queen herself um, is actually able to arrive at Ascot without having to get in a motor car. In other words, be driven there along the road. There is a linkage from Windsor Palace all the way through to Royal Ascot. So the queen can be transported without having to go on any public roads. And uh, again, it's part of her wonderful estate. Many, many people ask, ask us this question, why Ladies' Day? And as this poet, we don't know, we've tried to find out who this anonymous poet is. It was about the angels. And again, tomorrow being Thursday would be Ladies' Day. It is the busiest and the biggest part of the whole event. It is spectacular. And oh, once again, excuse the pun, excuse the cliche, oh my hat, you see some incredible sights. You will see people who have spent many, many hours with a designer, with a stylist, with a milliner, with someone who can just make them look like they should be on a ramp walking down Fashion Week to people who think they are stylists and they make their own hats and they make their own dresses. And again, it just lends itself to a day of just joy and happiness because no one looks miserable and you're just wowing and ooing and ahhing and stopping and looking and it's just something that just pleases the eye from the moment you arrive and it really really is as i said one of the most wonderful wonderful experiences the amount of money uh, again i know we shouldn't really talk about money but i just wanted to make you very aware that people take this so seriously people plan year on year for this big week and so the next slide i want to bring in is going to really cover sort of some of the statistics and the amount of money that gets spent on the clothing. And, and this is obviously something my wonderful colleague also uh, has done her research and we got the, the, the statistics from Deloitte on how much money uh, is actually thrown at the problem um, into people's outfits. And I think, no disrespect to you wonderful ladies, you ladies always make such an amazing effort. I think the men we get away lightly. Uh, with all due respect, yes, I love my morning suit. Maybe I might change my waistcoat from time to time. But as a, as a man, I'm almost sort of in, 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 a, in an area of being blessed that I don't have to really spend too much time, A, spending um, hours and hours on what am I going to wear, uh, spending hours and hours on deliberating of what should I wear. The men, I think we, 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 we do, I think, spoil. We get away very easily. You know, again, I just want to share with you that something like a top hat. And if you are, if any of you are interested, this is made of silk, brushed silk. And I was very fortunate. Uh, this didn't um, always belong to me. I found it on an auction site. Um, and I'm going to say that this particular top hat, it was made uh, in uh, by um, Christie's of London. And it's got the initials DR in there. So I don't know who that might, uh, is that Derek Rothschild? Is it Derek Reynolds? Who knows what it is? But I had to really search high and low for the correct sort of size of the hat. It needs to sit in a certain way on your head. And this was an acquisition which I managed to get at a reasonably good price. But I've seen these top hats go no word of a lie into the 15,000 pound marks uh, in, in, certain, in certain realms. Uh, and so you just need to look on eBay or look on Etsy or look on type in to Google uh, top hat uh, and you'll be absolutely amazed at how uh, sought after they are, a good quality one is that's well made, they are handmade. So again, men do have that side of spending money and it does make you sort of stand out and look, it, it, it's a proud moment. Uh, if you feel very sort of elevated, I do anyway when I'm dressed in my morning suit with my top hat. 
uh, the Royal Asset Guide, which I want to share a little video with you. And like everything, I think these sort of social events have had to come with the times. They've had to, they've had to adapt, uh, as you can well imagine, with dress code, and it still is very, very strict. It really is. But they've had to learn to adapt. They've had to learn to be a little bit more relaxed but still keeping a very high standard and still keeping an incredibly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, an, an elegant, a, a talk, talking about elegance. There's no, um, there's no element of uh, women or men looking that they are not at an amazing event, uh, if, that's, if I put that in hopefully in the correct polite sort of English. So again, I'd love to just, spend a few seconds i'm just going to go to share with you this next it's a, just a brief little video which i just wanted to bring into play on today's uh, webinar so just bear with me and i'll get this up and running i'll hopefully it prepared it there we go just want to share this with you and we can can everyone see that carol can we see that give me a thumbs up please So, that, if I just going to close that down, sorry, I'm just doing a little repeat there, I'll get that off. Just turn that off and then... So get back to the PowerPoint and then I can share this all with you. Just go back.
So please, ladies and gentlemen, if there are any questions that are starting to sort of, you, you, you really are um, over interested in some of the things I've been sharing with you, I would love the opportunity to um, answer these, these questions and help you as best I can with the knowledge that I have on what it is that we are um, talking about here today. Um, now, where are we? There we go. Right. So that there was obviously, sorry about the little delay there. So that there was very much this year's style guide. And every year, Royal Ascot makes a huge effort to introduce and make it a, an experience even before you attend. It, it really is something that I would really, and I keep going on about it, would love you all to, to make an effort, at least once in your life, to attend this incredible, incredible event. Here is just a little synopsis and a little recap on what was shared in that video. And I have been there when um, people have tried to enter into certain enclosures, not wearing the correct clothing. And unfortunately, no matter how much money you've paid for your tickets, you are turned away. It is very, very strict. They will not allow any uh, bending of any rules whatsoever. And every single year, People are not only betting on the horses, but last year when I was there, they actually bet, each day there's a bet, what is the queen going to be wearing today? Because each day she wears a different outfit. So there are bookies there and they've got their, their banners, they've got their, their betting stations, and you can bet at 10 pounds, five pounds on a guess. Is she gonna be in yellow? Is she gonna be in blue? What is she wearing today? And, and one of the wonderful ladies that joined us last year from Japan, she hit it spot on. And I think she actually won about a hundred pounds because she got the, uh, the color correct. So there's lots of fun. So not just about the horses. You also have the amazing opportunity to uh, purchase uh, memor mem memorabilia there. And the quality of memorabilia is absolutely outstanding. And everywhere you go, there are places and stations for drinks, bars. You book certain venues. You do have to book. If you decide to choose to go on your own, I would urge you to go online and pre-book if you're going into the Queen Anne enclosure and that neck of the woods. The other areas where it's slightly more casual, you take your own picnic, you literally throw a blanket down in an area and you make yourself at home. The other beautiful thing about Royal Ascot is that lots of organizations book marquees on the opposite side of the grandstand where you can have up to 16 people sitting in this under a gazebo and you can bring your butler along you can bring a catering company along to serve you and to make sure the day is even more memorable for you you don't have anything to worry about you are literally weighted on hand and foot so there are so many uh, options on how to embrace this particular day what I love about Royal Ascot is they are incredibly um, focused on welcoming foreigners to, uh, they encourage it and, and they love it when you make an effort to, to wear your national dress. And again, you stand out beautifully, people get talking to you, where are you from? And it's just a lovely way to connect with people. It is so, so special. Again, this is just another recap of what goes on in the Queen Anne enclosure. Um, you will, by the way, be getting a recording of today's event, so you don't have to be uh, writing down every bit of detail if you are writing anything down. You will notice the gentleman there in the picture, he's wearing a slightly different colored waistcoat. This is permitted. Ties have to be a certain width, for example. Uh, shoes, you're not allowed to wear the patent shoes, they have to be polished black shoes. You may not wear white socks, you have to wear dark socks. So that, this is my um, exact point is absolutely the attention to detail is on point. Two years ago, we had the privilege of entertaining an incredible group of our wonderful Japanese clients. Uh, we at the British School of Etiquette have a, um, a partner and we have the brand, the British School of Etiquette Japan. And once in, every year, uh, um, our Japanese partner brings between 16 and 20 people through to London during this week. 
And last year, we were able to uh, attend um, an incredible adventure, uh, adventure funny enough, on one of the old royal uh, trains, which is um, where the Queen Mother used to travel in. So we did that out of Victoria Station down to Kent to uh, Leeds Castle. We then had a day um, with the Rothschild family in Sussex. We walked around the gardens and um, Madame Rothschild sang to us. She's an opera singer. And then we attended this spectacular day at Ascot. That was last year. The year before, we took a group of incredible Japanese ladies again, and I organized along with a butler friend of mine, um, Chaba, he and I, we put together the Fortnum and Mason picnics, and we managed to get some beautiful tables literally right near the arch where the queen comes through. So we had our picnic, and about 10 minutes before two, or maybe quarter to two, I explained to all my guests, I said, if you get up now and you approach that fence, subtly and quietly you'll get a front row seat and you will see the queen and her entourage come straight past you and some of the pictures that were taken that day from the group were just outstanding and i have to tell you this i don't know whether god or whoever it is looking down upon us but the weather we've had has just been exponential it has just been beautiful we have to bring in the afternoon tea uh, and for some of those who know the british school of etiquette a lot of us, a lot of people are thinking, oh, the British school of is all about table manners and blah, blah, blah. Well, it is, yes, we do obviously teach table manners, but we go far deeper than that. We go into emotional intelligence. We talk about how to connect with people, how to grow your business through the power of etiquette and manners. But one of the beautiful pastimes we love working on and sharing with people is this journey of afternoon tea. So again, afternoon tea at Royal Asco is incredibly spectacular. And in my opinion, it has to be accompanied with a glass of champagne. So you really make it a royal Ascot afternoon tea. And here's some just incredible statistics. Um, again, I can't really compare these statistics to say Wimbledon, but I would imagine Wimbledon, Royal Ascot, uh, some of the polo events definitely have statistics that are very, very similar. And it's quite a huge amount of consumption going on as you, as, you, as you can see just from what is, is, is in front of you on the screen. And this is obviously a very good guesstimate. Um, I would imagine maybe people take a couple of hundred. You never know what goes on in the enclosures where people can take their own alcohol. So this is more coming along with statistics that they can get their hands on within the Royal Enclosure, the Queen Anne Enclosure, the Windsor Enclosure. And for any of you who are interested in joining us next year, we would love the opportunity to host you and give you this incredible experience at Royal Ascot. It really is, or even a week, we have a whole um, list of events that we bring in to the English season. And if you have the time and if you have the opportunity, it really would be such a privilege, A, to get to know you on a very personal level, uh, and B, to be able to entertain you and show you and give you that incredible, I love to call it that varavum, that amazing experience that so many people have been exposed to over the centuries. Uh, it's, it really is, and I keep going on, something rather amazing. It's out of this world, should I say. Many people say, Philip, what is the Queen's favorite event? I have to say, from what I've been told uh, through some pretty reliable sources, that the Queen's main biggest event that she absolutely loves more than her birthday celebration is Royal Ascot. And I know that yesterday she made an announcement uh, sharing her, her thoughts. Um, I think it was written in one of the newspapers, uh, you know, just wishing everyone well and sorry you cannot attend this event, but make the most of the week from behind closed doors. So from me to you listening uh, to what I've had to share, I would love this opportunity, uh, if I may, to go down to um, and, and see if there, what, what questions we have. Um, and, and Carol, if people would like to, it's a lovely small niche group, I would love the opportunity to engage with people verbally. So if anyone wants to actually ask questions and speak, then please feel free to do so. Ah, Kim, that's a great, great question. Who decides the dress codes for each year? They get a group of designers together and it's basically a board of people who give some parameters and give some guidelines. 
and therefore then designers come together and they start to obviously push their wares. So it's generally, if I can sort of say to you, it's, it's fairly gi a given of what you should wear. It, it's a given of what you should wear. There's some guidelines, but that uh, video that I shared with you is obviously heavily pushing the designers um, of the various clothing that is being shown. And, and obviously Cunard, which is a very well-known um, ship company, obviously for, for cruises, they get together and help sponsor the event. Um, is red long dress would be suitable to wear at such an event? Absolutely. Allah, that's 100%. The more flamboyant, absolutely. Uh, I've, we've seen some of the most incredible sights. So it really is extraordinary at what people wear. Uh, as long as you stick to the guidelines to wear a beautiful long red dress and you, you have find a hat that will really complement your dress, you no doubt, uh, I'm a big fan of red. You would stand out for all the wonderful right reasons. I know which milliner. There's so many wonderful milliners out there. Uh, they really and truly are. I'm not dodging the question. If you really, money is no object, you can, um, yeah, you can throw some serious money at the problem. In my view, you can also go to, uh, you know, good hat stores. So Harrods obviously sells hats. Harvey Nichols sells hats. You can even go to Marks and Spencers. It just depends what your budget is. Um, and, I, and again, um, I know I've worked with a very well-known milliner in the past. We've done some, some events together. An incredible milliner. She's made um, hats for some very famous people as well who attend these events. So I'm not really in a position to really recommend any one milliner. Uh, there's a very, very famous milliner here in the United Kingdom, again, that's been around for hundreds of years, called Lock & Co., and that's in St. James Street, going down to St. James's Palace in Pall Mall. Uh, they are very, very well known, and, and they've made, I don't know how many hundreds of hats for the royals and for famous people. So that's one of the milliners. But I think supporting an up-and-coming milliner is a lovely thing to do. I really do. Um, it's something that you give people an opportunity to show their wares. And I can well assure you, you never know. By choosing a milliner who's up-and-coming, who's studying, or been studying and, and, and has really tried to make their name out there. They just need that one photograph, boom, and it could change their life for the rest of their life uh, because they've made such an amazing looking hat and it gets spread all over the newspapers. And I have to share with all of you that the photography, the actual professional photographers that are there are from all over the world taking these pictures. At the end of the day at Aska, something I forgot to mention is they have live music and people by this stage, many, many people have had quite a lot to drink. So the volume is lifted, the joyity, the gaiety, the energy is lifted and people are hanging around um, at the uh, finishing enclosure, the winning enclosure and the music's going and people are singing together and the swaying starts. And I have to say, trying to leave uh, Ascot when that starts to happen, you've really got to sort of weave and worm your way through. It's, it's quite a challenge. Uh, so it's um, lots of fun uh, and you've got to be patient, that's for sure. Kim asks, uh, being the dress codes are so precise um, and I see the cross-dressing is allowed, do they need to follow the precise requirements as well? Kim, the, yeah, within reason, you, you, uh, sorry, yes, you do. You do have to follow the dress code, but they're not telling you what color to wear or how your, your, your cross-dressing can be. You do need to follow the perimeter, the, the, the guidance. So if that dress, if you're wearing a dress, it's gotta be below the knee. You're not allowed to have uh, straps that are a certain diameter. They need to be a certain diameter. You've gotta cover your shoulders. So yes, the, the dress code is very, very strict in that front. Um, yes, you're right, Kim. That, that amount um, of what I've shared with you is consumed in the five days. Um, about PIMS, is it the season's drink? Very much so. Having said that, PIMS, like everything, there's fashion drinks. So gin and tonic, gin and PIMS, gin and spritz. As you all know, for those of you who either are Italian or have Italian blood or spend time in Italy, the well-known apparel spritz can, has taken the stage as well in many of these events. But at the end of the day, the PIMS number one cup is the traditional British summer drink. And pins, 
it's, it's, a, it's known as a fruit punch. I tell you what, you've had two or three of those, tastes like cool drink, and next minute you're starting to feel fairly lightheaded. Although it's a, for those of you who enjoy a pimp, it's a wonderful feeling. And it's, it's a beautiful drink. And people make various uh, styles of pims. So some people want to create a pims and lemonade. Some might add a, a nip of gin in there. Some people create pims and lemonade and add some soda water to bring down the sweetness. Uh, the fruit is a key part to pims. You have to have mint and you have to have cucumber. Then the strawberries, a slice of apple, maybe a slice of orange, slice of lemon. This all makes for a great pims. Um, are there any other questions? Would anyone like to share anything else? Ah, again, yes, Maria, some of the strict um, rules do apply in, 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 some of the summer, in, in some of the events, very much so. It's uh, especially where there is the, um, the world and clothes and that sort of thing. So the Gold Cup, um, you've got, um, what's the other one? That, uh, Epsom Derby, the Derby is very, very famous again. Another very famous race, the Queen of Tens. Another, it's not as grand as Royal Ascot, but in certain enclosures, you have to stick to certain dress codes, very much so. Um, Carol, Carol, are you able? Are you there? Carol, if anyone wants to ask a verbal question, you, people don't have to type. I'm very, very happy to unlock the mics if you want to. Um, unmute yourselves. I don't know if that's at all possible. But please, please, while we're here together, ask any questions that you may have. I'd love to be able to engage with you. Any further questions? And I know, Maria, um, if you're able to speak, uh, you could always share with everyone your experience of your, of your um, yeah, if you would like to, let me just see if I can unmute people and then we can, um, I don't know how, how I do that. Um, okay, we can't obviously, by the look of it, um, offer you to be able to speak, but I know for a fact, um, Maria had really booked for this year to come along to, to Royal Ascot and we had to cancel. Uh, so if any of you want any guidance or steering or would like to speak to anyone that's attended one of our events at Royal Ascot, please feel free to reach out to Orsa. Ask Orsa to connect you with that individual. I know Maria is always very open to, to um, sharing her experience, not just at Royal Ascot, but her experience with the, Royal Brit with the British School of Etiquette. Uh, it's, um, it's something that I would urge you to do. Anyone, any further questions? And I would love to, while you're still on, I'd love to read something. So every year as a, as a, Royal, as, as a, as a member of the Royal Enclosure, uh, I would love to just share with you and read something to you that was in, um, in this particular um, brochure that was sent to me. So every year we get sent uh, a brochure on Ascot, not just for Royal Ascot, and it talks about the events. And it breaks down, it breaks down, this event starts on a Tuesday and it goes through to Saturday. So today's event, which was the 17th of June, whether strolling around the pristine lawns or enjoying a leisurely afternoon tea, those in the know adore this day. One that is both relaxed, off the track, and intense on it. The Group 1 Prince of Wales Stakes always attracts an elite field and is the highlight of a quality card that also includes three Group 2 races, the Queen Mary Stakes, the Queen Bar, and the Duke of Cambridge Stakes, while the Royal Hunt Cup is often one of the biggest betting contests of the entire week. And then each day is broken down, as you can see from this particular brochure. Now, one thing I'd love to read to all of you here is there's an amazing picture of the Queen in her absolute glory. As you can see, look how happy she looks. Uh, and I would love to just read, if I may, just to bring this um, webinar to a close. Our crowning glory, it's entitled. One of the most anticipated events in the British summer sporting and social calendar. Royal Ascot 
is an unforgettable five days of sp spectacular pageantry, unparalleled racing, high fashion, and fine dining, truly, a, truly an occasion like no other. From the arrival of the royal procession, as the clock strikes two, to the communal singing around the Ascot's bandstand, this, as, and this is an event which must be seen to be believed. As Britain's most valuable race meeting, Royal Ascot is re revered across the globe and attracts many of racing's finest horses to compete for millions of pounds in prize money, with six world-class races on the, on the card each afternoon, and astonishing 19 group races, of which no fewer than eight boasts group one status, have made household names of the likes of Yates, Black Caviar and Frankel. Her Majesty the Queen, a lifelong lover of horse racing and a passionate racehorse owner and breeder, has graced all five days of the Royal Meeting every year since her coronation in 1953. In 2013, Her Majesty's filly, Estimate, landed the Gold Cup, the first time in the history of the Royal Meeting that is most that is its most prestigious race has been won by the reigning monarch. Royal Ascot is of course equally synonymous and sartorial elegance being awash with exquisite fashion and the most magnificent millinery creations. An abundance of formal and casual dining uh, options make it the perfect occasion for socializing with friends or thanking clients with a la carte luncheons, gourmet picnics, afternoon teas and fine dining in one of Ascot's stunning restaurants each offering their own cuisine, atmosphere, and views of the race course. All five days have their own distinct character, each a whirlwind of excitement and color, sharing the same glorious atmosphere and sense of occasion. Each is unmistakably Royal Ascot. So that, that there, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, I think one or two more questions may have come in. What sort of tickets would be, oh, great question, Adriana. Beautiful, beautiful question. So it's actually very easy to get tickets, believe it or not. The ticket sales tend to come out, uh, I think it's around January, February time, if I'm not mistaken, maybe March. And the earlier you book your tickets, you get small little discounts. Uh, but you could do it personally yourself. We as an organization would do it on your behalf. We're not going to charge anything extra to book your tickets because it's, part of the package we organize. Um, and again, I think going for your first time, if you're going on your own with a, group, a bunch of friends, I personally would recommend the Queen Anne enclosure. No disrespect to the enclosures that have a little bit more free and easy access. Uh, unfortunately, toward the end of the day, to put it very politely, it tends to become fairly messy um, across the board. I would urge you, in my opinion, and from my experience, to encourage you to go to the Queen Anne enclosure. Absolutely. Maria, and, and by the way, tickets range from around, from memory, and they change every year. Tickets start depending on which enclosure it is, but I'm talking now the Queen Anne enclosure. You're looking roughly around 80 odd pounds just for a ticket to go in. Uh, if you want picnics and things like that, they start to obviously they're, they're bolt-ons. You can find various packages which we offer, um, and we just help you uh, enjoy the day and chaperone you and make sure that you don't have to think about anything whatsoever. We're, we we have an incredible team that um, makes the day very very special and memorable. Um, so that is what I would recommend, Adriana. Maria, going back to the Chelsea Flower Show, yes, um, there is. A, a certain dress code you have to adhere to, very much so. And again, Chelsea Flower Show runs over a period of time. I would urge anyone who loves plants and flowers, if you love that sort of thing and you want to come to London for it, the weather can be tempestuous. As you know, British weather can be a bit off the wall. Having said that, the last three or four years have just been absolutely outstanding, especially around the Ascot season. And actually today would have been the most wonderful day to be. I'm just looking at the skylights I have above me. Uh, the, the day would have been absolutely spectacular. So always, uh, you know, be very aware of the weather here in the United Kingdom. The winter season, is there a winter season in the United Kingdom? There's not a so-called winter season, but yes, I would like to say there is in a roundabout way because there's a certain time when the lights get turned on in London and that in itself, Regent Street, Oxford Street, you have ice 
um, ice displays. You now have what we call a winter wonderland, which is obviously very commercial in Hyde Park. But there is a winter season. Uh, we've got German markets taking place along the embankment in the Thames. There are fantastic uh, shows that go on. Um, and um, oh, I've just had an absolute blank. We have, uh, what do we call them? Um, someone help me. Shows where very famous people act in them and it's all tongue in cheek. Pantomimes. We have pantomimes. So pantomimes, we've had Dolly Parton feature in them. We've had David Hasselhoff feature in them. And these are all just funny, tongue in cheek, real family get togethers and, and great, great fun. So the energy and the ambiance in London and, and the UK, funny enough, it is a beautiful part of the world to visit um, for, for, for these wonderful um, reasons. And if you're ever so fortunate to be engaged or embraced with some snow, it just adds to that sort of charm. Please, if there are any other questions, I would love to answer them. I love the questions that have been coming through. Oh, Kim, you've asked, is it purely virtual? It is, unfortunately. I mean, obviously, there are going to be organizers there. There would be people guarding the premises, because no doubt, uh, unfortunately, you get certain people out there who want to you know, be silly and, and tempt their luck. You do, there will be, obviously, people taking care of the grounds and people you know, handling the horses and that sort of thing, but there are no guests at all this year. I'm just seeing if I've missed any other. Yeah, as Maria put in, I think you might all be able to see the Q&A, hopefully. It's a once in a lifetime event. I truly believe it is, um, and I'm not just saying that. I, I'm, you know, even, even if I weren't privileged and fortunate enough to, to incorporate the British School of Etiquette in my life, I would be going year in and year out uh, with friends, with family. And the other beautiful thing is, by the way, um, wonderful audience, is that children can go start going from a certain age. Um, and it's rather charming to see these young girls, I say young girls, you know, um, I think it's from the age of, don't quote me on this, I'm not um, a fay. It, it could be as young as 14 or maybe slightly younger. They have to be accompanied by an adult. But it's just so lovely to see them beautifully dressed and, and really looking the part. Uh, it, makes, it makes for, again, um, a great ambiance to see children being introduced into such a wonderful um, event. Any further questions? Not necessarily, Maria, no. The songs uh, tend to be from all over the world. Um, songs that people love to sing along to, songs that are very catchy, songs that people hopefully can pick up a sort of tune to, because as you can imagine, after a few drinks under the belt, people all of a sudden feel that they are a Sinatra or an Andrea Bocelli, and the volume goes up and up and up, and uh, these are songs that people hopefully can cotton on to fairly quickly and easily. Without further ado, I want to thank you very, very much for your time uh, and making the effort to join us on this webinar, a lovely niche little group. I urge any of you who are interested in entertaining this as an, as an option, please do get hold of Orsa, send us an email. It's a great day out to give someone the gift for a, a present of whether it be a wedding anniversary or whether it be a birthday present or a, a Christmas present or something as a surprise. You can really knock people's socks off with such a beautiful um, type of experience. It, 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 it'll last for decades. And um, as we can see from some of the pictures, and by the way, a lot of the pictures that you've seen in today's presentation, we've uh, either taken ourselves, uh, the, my backdrop was taken a couple of years ago. And that this wall that you see behind me you line up, believe it or not, people are queuing up to have their pictures taken. People are queuing up to have pictures taken with the guards that are there. Uh, people are queuing up to have pictures with uh, very distinguished people. Um, and it's, an, it, yeah, it's just wonderful. Everyone's really happy and obliging, I have to say. Any, anyone else, please, 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 before I sign off, I'd love to engage in any further questions. 
And by the way, if you if you, if you think of a question and I haven't been have, we haven't and you haven't had a chance to write it, type it down. Um, I would love you to please send us an email um, and ask any questions you may have. If we can shed any lights on anything you want to find out. And again, we really do try and make an effort to bend over backwards to make the day an experience. We're not in the accommodation industry, but we'll be more than happy to guide you and steer you in some of the hotels that we respect and that we work very, very closely with. Again, we're not in the business of trying to make money from recommending you to anything at all. I promise you that. Uh, we will just help you to the best of our ability to give you the guidance and steering. So again, I'm going to be bidding on, on, my, on my way. Um, so I want to thank you all again so much for your time, your questions, and I do hope we have the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face next year, 2021, where we will be able to really embrace and you will be well prepared having attended this webinar on the do's and don'ts or on something to really, really, really look forward to because I promise you right now, I can assure you I will make it my utmost effort to make sure that you have an experience of a lifetime with that attention to detail. So thank you so much and I wish you all, wherever you are in the world, I can see there are people from the States, from Brazil, great rest of the day for you over in that part of the world, for the people in this part of the world, wishing you a fantastic evening. For those people who dialed in from even later time zones than we are right now, thank you for making the effort to join in. And I bid you all the most wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. And we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you so much.